to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide Buddy, he's your Peptide Buddy. Welcome to the Peptide Buddy SARMS series. I've been meaning to look into these compounds for some time per the recommendations of quite a few of you, but I do recognize this is a peptide-focused channel and so didn't want to in any way neglect those who are here for the cut to the chase and evidence-based peptide info that myself and you are thankfully passionate about. But I do acknowledge the crossover between the spaces of peptides and SARMs, so we'll do a mini-series going into them. SARMs are a controversial topic, even though initially investigated in the 90s, their safety, clinical utility, and mechanisms are still highly debated. But before we address the compounds in particular, it's worth doing a walkthrough on what even a SARM is, because the term is oftentimes used to describe different compounds that don't fall into the same category. For instance, I've seen MK677 or ibutamarin called a SARM and a peptide, but truth be told, it's neither. It's actually technically a non-peptide agonist of the ghrelin growth hormone secretagogue receptor. So as many of us know, a SARM is a selective androgen receptor modulator, not to be confused with a SERM, which is a selective estrogen receptor modulator, and also not to be confused with a PARM, which describes an Italian cheese used to craft fantastic delicious dishes. All terrible jokes aside, the first thing we've got to take a look at is the androgen receptor, which is a complex topic to discuss that we're going to attempt to simplify here. So as a steroid hormone receptor, the androgen receptor, after binding a sex hormone, translocates to the cellular nucleus and influences gene expression. And the compounds the androgen receptors bind are, of course, androgens like testosterone and dehydrotestosterone known as DHT. And testosterone and DHT are together responsible responsible for development of the male reproductive system, secondary sexual characteristics, among other popularly and less popularly discussed features in males and females alike. And the conversion of testosterone to DHT and many other steroid molecules are modulated by enzymes whose activities are regulated by the presence of many different compounds and biologic need. As a side note, some of this may seem too intricate, but my goal is to provide enough info where we can grasp an understanding of the complexity that exists so that I don't make any overwhelming generalizations while trying not to derail the conversation. And speaking of derailment, here's a quick self-plug to like and subscribe if you've made it this far. I admire your willingness to not fall asleep. Alright, so now when we're talking about DHT and testosterone, the rules are truly multifarious. But in general, when we think about DHT, what comes to mind is development of male characteristics through puberty, and as we age, it's actually implicated in male pattern baldness and prostate enlargement. Testosterone, as we think about popularly, is more known for these signs and symptoms of vitality and masculinity, sharing a relationship with muscle and fat mass, production of red blood cells, mood, and libido, amongst other things. And testosterone shares such a relationship with DHT that conversion from T to DHT is modulated by an enzyme called 5-alpha reductase. And after testosterone is converted to DHT, it's known as the 5-alpha reduced metabolite of testosterone because that's that's what it is. Testosterone is inserted into the reaction and DHT comes out, binds to the same receptor, and has its own independent actions and pharmacokinetics. Okay, so now back to that androgen receptor where testosterone and DHT bind. DHT is known to be more biologically active than testosterone. This essentially means that it doesn't just bind to the receptor more strongly with higher affinity, but the rate at which it dissociates or falls off is lower than that of testosterone. Now, when people administer steroid hormones, different compounds have varying androgenic and anabolic effects. When we talk about anabolic, what comes to mind is increased muscle mass and bone density. But androgenic effects comprise things like acne, fertility, virilization, which is a term that describes enhancement and augmentation of male characteristics. And depending on the size and shape of the compound that binds the androgen receptor, among other factors like specific tissue location, the subsequent signaling pathways involved determine how androgenic versus how anabolic the effects are. Obviously, there's a very intricate relationship between testosterone and DHT, and their interaction with the androgen receptor at different stages throughout life. This relationship, which is already super complex at that, highlights how SARMs, by selectively targeting androgen receptors in specific 
specific tissues aim to harness the benefits of androgens like testosterone and DHT while potentially mitigating some of the unwanted side effects associated with traditional steroid use, which in my opinion sounds pretty darn complicated. So SARMs, Selective Androgen Receptor Modulators. As the name suggests, these compounds would bind and modulate the androgen receptor while the selectivity refers to tissue specificity. So the ability to enter and bind androgen receptors in certain tissues. While exogenously injected testosterone activates androgen receptors diffusely, owing to its diverse range of adverse effects, the idea is that perhaps SARMs could target specific tissues and effects, rather than, for instance, since touching the prostate or the heart. Hence why anabolic steroids are also known as androgenic anabolic steroids, because they are just that for the most part at least, or have varying degrees to which they are androgenic and anabolic. So as an androgen receptor modulator, in theory, different SARMs could be chemically designed to have varying degrees of androgenic and anabolic effects, so people could figuratively get the best of both worlds while avoiding unwanted targets. All right, so in essence, I think this is a good place to take a break. We've reviewed the general nature of the SARM and what in theory it could be used for. I hope that was simple enough to follow, but in-depth enough to give you an introductory overview of a rather complex topic. Regardless, thank you for watching. And if there is anything that needs further clarification, please do leave a comment. If you are looking for a way to further support the channel, details of the Patreon will be in the description below. That page is where all my created charts and graphs go. I post updates about the peptide space and all the videos are user requested. Also, as we've made a habit by now, the sources consulted to make this video will be in the description below. Thank you for watching. I hope you have a great day and take care. Cut to the chase, evidence-based. Pull up a chair, let's get this straight. Peptide buddy, he's your peptide buddy.